Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rhonda Weisberg with Channel 63 and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Up Close and Personal. We are in the home today of Alan Small and this is another in our series, a very important one in our series of the Holocaust. And a lot of people within Ballon Isle know Alan on a very personal, social level as I do and they know something about his history. Um, this is our opportunity to get to know Alan and what he has gone through, what he's come to, what his life is like now here in Ballon Isle. What we'd really like to find out, what we'd like to focus on is what your life was like from a very young child on living in Poland and all that happened to you and your family all that you went through, which is the most remarkable story. So, Alan, bring us to your life as an early child in Poland. You had a normal life, you had parents, you had family, you have three sisters, and give us a little bit of a description as to what your daily life was like okay. there. Okay, well, we'll start off. I was born in a village in eastern Poland called Nikolaevo. When I was about three, three and a half years old, my parents moved east of that village to a, a town called Ivia. And the things that I remember really is since I was about four or five years old and I had a very nice home. Parents, I had three sisters. My grandmother lived with us. My father was in business. And uh, we had a happy, a happy childhood I had. We always spoke and brought up in a nice Jewish tradition. My father wasn't really too orthodox, but uh, every Jew that lived in the small towns was, the, was belonged to a temple. We had three temples in my hometown. Uh, the, my two older sisters graduated from public school. When the war broke out, I was in the fifth grade. I was going to Hebrew school. Now, I can only speak what happened to me and what happened in my hometown when the Russians came in. And, you couldn't have your own business, and it wasn't that easy, but it was bearable enough to live more or less not as nice as we lived before the war. And things have changed from being nice in a nice home, a nice family, it's like everything turned upside down. And uh, that went on until 1941, when Germany attacked Russia. It was June 22nd, 1941. By the for end of first week, the Germans started bombing our town and they destroyed one of the main streets there, half of it. They used to take out all the men and make them clean the streets and, uh, and do things that it's actually, uh, uh, there's no sense in it. I'll give you an example. When the Russians left, they left about 10 kilometers near east of us. They left one of the biggest tanks that they produced prior to the war. It's called the Stalin tank. And they made all the men pull the tank for, the, for 10 kilometers with rope and bring him into the town. And they were standing and taking pictures of me. And the people that lived in town were smiling, having a smile on their faces, just looking what the Jews are exposed to. Uh, to be, I mean, it's almost impossible to explain this, you know, what happened from going overnight from one, uh, more or less a normal life and get into that you're not, you're not like, they treat you like you're not a human being. When the Germans came in, they didn't know anybody in town, but people that lived, the non-Jewish, uh, the Christians that lived, Polish people, they volunteered to, uh, they were to, be, to become policemen in town and to work together with the Germans. And they, of course, they knew everybody because prior to the war, we all were friends. So when they volunteered, the uh, Polish, uh, especially young people, they instructed all the Jewish men from 16 to 60 to report in the marketplace. They picked out 224 men out of the entire group, including my father. And the uh, policemen they went and pointed fingers who's who and, uh, in, in the crowd. And since my father was a businessman, they picked him out too. And uh, they were, prior to that day, the SS and also the Lithuanian uh, policemen came in, which uh, I would say the Lithuanian police were some, at times worse than the German police. And they took my father and the uh, entire rabbinical staff and the teachers, like I mentioned before, they took him a mile away, a little over a mile from my house, and they shot him. 
and that went on until from uh, August 1st when my father was killed until by the end of the, that same year they gave an order for all the Jewish uh, people you know they assigned a certain quarter in town and they made it to be segregated from everybody else and uh, like instead of having uh, one family house they put in other families with us in my house must have had about 10 people already by then living and uh, it went on until uh, like this till the end of uh, 1941. In 1942, in May 8, 1942, they, uh, we got up and we see the entire town is uh, surrounded by, uh, by Germans, like I said before, by the SS and by the Lithuanians. And mentioning Lithuanians, I want for people to know that the Germans, you know, of course they are responsible for everything, but without the help of all these people, they could never have accomplished because they didn't know anybody who's who in town. And uh, also the police, the Polish police, then you turn around and you see that kids that went to school with you and people that you considered your friends and nobody was there except seeing smiles on their faces and, and happy what they doing to the Jewish people. So May 8th we got up and the entire section, the, the, the Jewish section was surrounded by, by the Germans, by the SS and by the Lithuanians and the Polish police. And, for, from the, and we were not allowed to go because we didn't have running water there. We didn't have uh, any in the house. We had outhouses and whoever wanted to go to the outhouse, we, we shot him right on the spot and, and they kept us from May 8th until May 12th. And May 12th, they woke everybody up at eight o'clock, about five o'clock in the morning. And they started screaming and yelling, Ali, you and Rosman, all the Jews should get, get out and from the houses and I see and there was you hear, can hear screams and crying and shooting going on and as my mother and my sisters and my grandmother maternal grandmother lived with us she was 75 years old and uh, they started going out and of course I expected to go with my mother and my sisters and by the way my sister my oldest sister she had a baby because her husband uh, escaped as the Red Army retreated she, he escaped with the Red Army so and she was pregnant she couldn't go with him so she gave birth as a matter of fact uh, you know during the German occupation and with the baby and they uh, chased everybody out and uh, I, did, I wanted to go with my mother and my sister. So and I held on to my mother's sleep and I said, please let me go with you. And my mother said to me, no, you're not gonna go on. We had a, an entrance to the attic, uh, an entrance that you, you couldn't notice it unless you know where it was. And she made me hide in the attic and she, the whole last words, and she insisted I go and I kept on asking her, I want to go with you, mom. And she said, no, you're going to hide, you're going to survive and I'll always watch over you. And, uh, and she says, just make sure that you survive and, I'll, and, uh, and you'll tell what happened here. And, uh, and I might as well tell you, she said, Let's see if you can take revenge. There's a word in Yiddish, they say, ne come. And she says, just in it. so my entire life, you know, after that was terrible. And, uh, and by, by the way, that day, they, I, that was the last time I saw my mother and uh, two of my sisters and my grandmother. And uh, that day they killed uh, 25, over 2,500 people, men, women, and children. They uh, took them to the same place there where my father was shot. So like I said before, about a mile probably away from our home. They made them undress, and uh, and whoever was lucky to be shot dead uh, was really lucky at that time because people were wounded and they piled them up one after the other. And from that morning, and then and I was still in the attic hiding and and looking like a, being curious what's going on. We had two windows in front of that attic facing the main street and the market, and. Uh, and I, I started hearing only the machine guns going and, and uh, shooting, and by 12 o'clock, everything got quiet. There were no more shooting, and I said, I was wondering what was going on, and all of a sudden I hear cries and screams in the, in the house, and uh, again, I didn't know whether I should get, get out from the attic and come down to the house or stay there, and it, thoughts came through my mind, what am I going to do now? Who's going to help me? Who's going to hide me? And, uh, and, and really, his, uh, I was at that time, I was 1942, so I was 14 years, old, uh, 14 years old. And I said, what am I going to do? So then I decided to just 
I open up the door to the attic and I jumped out and I see people, so many people at that time in the house, you know, and everybody's screaming and crying and women were sick, pulling their hair and, and they didn't even notice when I came out from the attic. They, they, you know, everybody was like in a different world. And I ran into the uh, room by my ear. Uh, my parents used to sleep there and I walk in and I see my sister, my oldest sister that day was not uh, killed with a baby for reasons that uh, maybe some other time I'll tell you because it's also will take too long. And, uh, and she's, my sister is sitting there and pulling her hair and screaming and crying and the baby's crying in the crib. And, and, uh, and I was standing in front of her. She didn't even know who I was. She didn't even realize and I started shaking her. I said, it's me, it's me. And I said, what happened? She says, everybody's dead. You know, they, they killed 2,500 people, but with all the Jews that came from the small villages, they all congregated them in my town, so it'll be easier for the Germans, you know, not to go from village to village to find the Jews. So it, I think it, it remained uh, another, about a thousand or maybe over a thousand people yet, and they worked for the Germans, you know, and uh, uh, they, we figure, you know, when your eyes are open, you always think uh, maybe, maybe you'll survive. And then one day in December, I can't remember exact date, but it was, it was towards the end of December, uh, we got up and the entire ghetto with the remaining Jews was surrounded. It was the coldest winter at that time. And I saw them with a black uniform. The police were wearing black uniform, the Nazis, the SS, and you couldn't get out of the house. And then all of a sudden it came a order from the head of the, uh, the, gend the gendarmes, the Germans, that uh, they're going to take everybody to a labor camp, what I mentioned to you before in the, to, in the east, to a labor camp. But they also played tricks because they, uh, and they said that the worry you can take with you uh, uh, whatever you can carry. You know? And I said to my, and they allowed us to walk around in the ghetto and be ready because they'll take us to the railroad station or by, by, by trucks or by trucks or whatever it was. I, and uh, I said to my sister, I said, uh, I'm gonna take a look what's going on there. So I walked out of the house and I, and, and I was wearing my father's uh, sheepskin, which was three or four sizes to begin my father's boots, you know, that he had. And uh, I walked over to the gate and the gate, and they make an announcement that all the uh, Jewish people that work in the tannery, we had a tannery in town, which the tannery was very important to them. They used to make leather, you know, out of skins, and uh, they used to make uh, saddles for the cavalry and other things. So they said everybody should report to the gate that works there. And there were maybe a dozen of, less than a dozen of men, Jewish men, they reported to the gate. And as the gate opened up with me without thinking what or when, and I, as the gate opened up, you know, right across the gate, maybe 100 or 150 feet, was also a Jewish home, but nobody was there because the, the, that where it ended, the ghetto started. And I ran out and I started running toward the homes that nobody lived there in the snow. And they started shooting at me. And, uh, and I, I, I remember being hit with a bullet in my right arm, but they didn't touch me, just went through the sheepskin and thing. And I uh, started running and all day and I was hiding. And, and, and then finally it came to the, uh, the evening and I didn't know what to do, where to go. So I decided to go to the village where I was born because I know the people were there. And my, by the way, my grandmother, when she lived there, she was an innkeeper. So I said, I'll go there, and I'm sure that the people over there, they always got along with the Jewish people, you know. The villages there, they didn't, have, you know, of course, there was anti-Semitism, but especially in those villages, the Jews and the, and the Christian got along very nicely in the village where I was born. And it took me all night almost to walk through the forest. I had to get there, and I was afraid. While I was walking, the dogs were barking every area that I walked, and, the, and I was scared, but I made it. It was, I would say it took me a few hours to get there because the snow was heavy. And I came to that village and I knocked on the door to my grandmother's uh, house. They knocked on the door and the woman opened up the door and she knew me because, by the way, when my grandmother, before she moved to live with us in town, she stayed there in that village and everybody knew her. And I used to go when I was a kid yet to, go to spend the summertime, maybe a week, sometimes 10 days. And when the woman opened up, the Christian woman, she saw me, I was like, I frozen almost walking and she grabbed me pulled me in the house and uh, then I found again like I said to go into detail everything it's impossible but this is how I I was there 
and that's where I met up with the partisans. Partisan is actually, you know, it, during the Second World War, a lot of, not only the Russians started the partisans, it was uh, they, uh, when they escaped and they were organizing small groups in the forests, you know, and fighting in all over Europe, it was actually the partisans, you know. And in Russia, there's many the, the, uh, names hard to explain, but partisans in Europe, when you say partisan, is attributed to people that were fighting during the war against the Germans. When they say fight out in the open fighting, they were in the forest, they used to, uh, like I said, they uh, destroy the bridges, they destroy uh, trains and all that, and that's, that's a partisan. And uh, the, the Jewish, there were Jewish partisans, which uh, they escaped, it wasn't easy, and they joined the, part, the Jewish partisans and during the war. There were between 20 to 30,000 Jewish partisans in all the European countries. But I would say, in my personal opinion, it was more or less more in the uh, east of Poland, you know, and it was closer to Russia. And, uh, but it was a problem because uh, it, was, it wasn't easy to escape. And when they escaped the Jews from the ghettos to join the partisans, the partisans didn't want to take him in because they expected you to come with a rifle or, or to get a, a rifles or machine guns or whatever. So they didn't want to take you in. And then if you wanted to go back, you had to fight two, two kinds of partisans uh, in, in your life, the Jews had to fight. But maybe, you know, I'm more outspoken and I'll, I usually tell it. And I hope that people try to understand me, not that I I have against there's good and bad among everybody but we had a lot of problems even because there were also Polish partisans there was the, the there was cry army Krajowa there was the 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 people's army there were another one and they they actually wouldn't take in any Jews and they wouldn't help them the Polish and a lot of on any occasions they used to kill the Jews take the back the rifles to them and not to accept them to their partisans the same thing was also with the Russians the anti-Semitism was very great. It flourished. In other words, after the war broke out and all of a sudden the, you, you thought it was anti-Semitic, but everybody was anti-Semitic. Even the Russian partisans was hard for a Jew. You had to prove yourself when you were in the Russian partisans. In the beginning of January, which uh, in all my papers says from January 1st, I uh, was with the Russian partisans. And, uh, and I was, by then already I was 15 years old. And uh, they gave me a hard time because I was mostly with Russian partisans, not with Jewish partisans. I had maybe a handful of uh, uh, five or six Jewish partisans, some of them were from my hometown with the Russians. And, uh, and it took me about five or six months, you know, before I got used to them. You know, I didn't know how to use the uh, rifle, I didn't do it. So I used to go on uh, missions. You know, with the, of course, the, and the, it, was a, it was a brigade, and the, each brigade in the partisans were named after a Russian leader or a communist uh, leader, you know, and so, so the, the brigade that I was, was called Stalin's Brigade. And they had a reputation for being very anti-Semitic, the Stalin Brigade. In 1944, when the German army started retreating, we took the cavalry horses, and I was riding a cavalry horse you know, me and another uh, scout who was a gypsy because the Germans, the, uh, the Germans killed the gypsies too, you know. And they sent us on a mission, just the two of us, you know, to deliver some uh, to the Russian army already behind the lines. And, and I ran in with him, we were riding on the German, the cavalry was pretty good horses. And we're riding to see a fire there, we thought it was partisans. And we get close to them and we see it's all Germans, they, with the fire burning at night. And I said to him, why? his name was Vanya, I said, Vanya, they're not ours. They are Germans, so we turned around with the horses and they go fast. If I had a farmer's horse, I would be dead today. Well, I, uh, what I want to say is that I mentioned that when we came uh, to Minsk, and like I explained to you before, that uh, since I was 16, you know, you have it all there. They didn't take me to the army, so I came back to my hometown. And when I came back to my hometown, and I hitchhiked from, uh, from Minsk uh, to hitchhike because, you know, the, at that time there were no train schedules, there were no buses, and nothing, you know, you, you have to go on military truck. So I stopped that truck and I said, which way are you driving? So he says, and he had to go through my hometown. So I'll never forget that was in 1944 because, like I said, whoever was not old enough to go into the army, they let them uh, go back to their hometown where they come from. And I jumped off the truck, I got off, 
and I don't know who's in town, who survived. I don't know anybody over there. And I see uh, a bunch of um, Polish people are standing there, the men which they knew me, and they were shocked to see me jumping off the truck because they were sure that I never survived, that I was killed. They didn't, li they didn't like to see me over there because I knew too much about them. And uh, I walked into the, uh, the police station, the KGB and all that, and I found out who's alive, and it just happened my second cousin survived also in Belsky Satrat with his uh, wife and a little girl. And they told me that he lives uh, about a uh, quarter of a mile away from the center of town. So the first thing I did though, I went to my house and I see my house is standing over there. And uh, I, I walked in, that's right, I walked into the house. I didn't know the people that lived in town. I walked in from one end to the other. And of course I was choked up with emotions and I walked out. And I, ne and I was there for over a year in that time. I never walked in again to my house. I didn't, I didn't want no part of the house. I didn't want to live with that. And I uh, went to my cousin and he was happy to see me and the other people, the survivors. A lot of them survived and thank God for, you know, to, for Belsky, they were there. Not all the, the entire time, but sometimes by nice Christians, very nice Christians that helped them out, you know, and then they joined Belsky's. And I was in town and, uh, and I had to go to work, you know, in town. What am I going to do? I was 16 and there were no men around because everybody was in the army. And at 16, and I have to say that I already went through, I was 16 going on 50, I should say, on 40. And I started working for the, uh, for the police and uh, believe it or not, at my age, you know, they made me the, there was a passport division for the, in the police department and also the NKVD. And the, and the guy the, uh, in charge of the uh, passport division, he was a wounded veteran, not from my hometown, so uh, he was in charge and um, I became his assistant and I started getting letters from people for, uh, inquiring about who survived from the war and I answered everybody, you know, and I, I, I even reunited, united families that no, one didn't know about the other one who survived. And I was there till uh, from 1944 till 1945 and according to, to my age by then I, because when I joined the partisans they asked me how old they are instead of saying 14 I said 15 so they, by then already I was 18 years old so they took me into the Russian army but, but most of the survivors uh, left and they went to Poland because they had a law at that time that if you are a Polish citizen prior to the uh, Second World War you can move to Poland and I refused to move to Poland because I didn't want to be exposed to the same things that I was exposed uh, during the war and uh, so I went into the Russian army. I was in the Russian army from 1945 to 1946. While being in the Russian army I uh, I was lucky also because uh, at that time they started, you know, uh, uh, you know, to uh, take in all this, uh, the, the farmers, all the people that probably didn't have any education, and they asked for my uh, uh, how much, what, do I, what kind of education do I have. So I told them that I finished public school, which I never did finish public school, and uh, and from the entire battalion, I don't think anybody finished public school. And they made me uh, chief clerk of the, uh, of the battalion. And while being chief clerk of the battalion, my battalion moved to, uh, they sent us out to the Polish border for, because that was in a city called Bobrovsk in Russia, where I was supposed to take my basic training, but never took basic training there. And they uh, brought us to uh, Brest-Litovsk. And that's where I, actually there I became the chief clerk of the, uh, of the battalion. From the Russian army, I was transferred to the Polish army. I never reported to them. The medals here, the partisan medal, everybody being to prove that you're a partisan, everybody at a certain length. You, you wouldn't get a medal like this if you're three months, you know. So they gave each one of us a medal and they, they give you a paper to acknowledge who, why you got a medal and what, how long you served in the partisans. When I was transferred from the, Pol from the Russian army to the Polish army, you know, the train stopped in the, over the border there. And, and uh, instead of me reporting to the Polish army, the two Jewish guys from the, Palestine, from the Jewish organization, there was no Israel, then they passed by the train and they were looking for guys like me to, to send them to Palestine to fight the, you know, the, the British, you know, because we had experience. And I, I left my wooden suitcase and I followed them and we were away about 100, 200 feet from the train. They told me who they represent. 
and we were on the ground in, in Poland for, for a number of weeks there. And then I said, where's the shoemaker? They took me to a shoemaker and I had the shoemaker take over one, one uh, hill and put on the two medals from the army and the partisan. The, the other he took off the, and it put those two uh, papers that come with it. And then it's a long way to tell you. They, we, they smuggled me with another group of people. They smuggled me to uh, Germany and the train stopped on the Russian uh, site. And before they let the trains go through there because they smuggled us as German refugees, you know, real Germans. And then the, mili the military police from the Russian military police, they looked in each uh, car to see if there were any deserters like me. And they picked me up. He looked at me and it, I didn't look to him like German. And he says to me to come down from the train. So, and I left at him, and my, my stomach is uh, in nuts, you know, and I, and I left at him, and he says in Russian to the guy, show me what's at me, what's he laughing? And I says to him, I said, answer him in German, I don't understand what he's talking about. So they made me come down the train, they interrogate me, and everybody was watching that. And while he's speaking to me, and I keep yelling to him in German, I answer him in German. So the sergeant said to the lieutenant, the, when the, when the, the uh, and KGB, he said, can't you see he's not, or he's one a German bastard, let him go. I wound up in the American zone in Germany. And then a displaced person came be called Nye Freiman outside of Munich. And I was there from 1946. I got there in spring of 1946, and I was there till 1947. In uh, and actually, originally I was supposed to go to Palestine that time, but by then already I got in touch with my uncle in America, my mother's brother. And I came to New York City, July 17, 1947. And my uncle, they didn't have any children. Of course, he's uh, everything. When I talk about my uncle, he's like my own father. They were very good to me. In 1947, I came in. I was a cutter, then I became, a, in Encline, I became a cutting room manager. And I was the youngest one in the garment industry at that time to be a cutting room manager. And while a cutting room manager, I started climbing the ladder very, uh, very fast in there. And uh, I improved production and I did a lot of things that the company was very happy with me. And after a short time, I became assistant production manager. Then I became production manager. And we had an office in Hong Kong at that time already. The company started growing. And uh, as the company grew, I was promoted, to, kept on being promoted. And uh, I, be, uh, I was in charge of the Hong Kong office. Then we dealt with uh, with Turkey, I was in Turkey, and also with Seoul, North, South Korea. And uh, one day they, uh, the management called me in and they had a reorganization in the company and they felt that I can improve the company if I take over to, because by then we had already inclined two and, uh, and Dana Karen was already went on her own and they asked me to be uh, president of Van Klein, which I really didn't want it because my uh, strength lied in production and I had never been in sales, And but they insisted that I should take over the company and I uh, uh, became president. I was president for about a year because I like to be in production and travel and do things. So they uh, created a new position. They made me senior vice president for, for not just for Ankline, for all the divisions. And I became senior vice president for worldwide sourcing and production. And um, under my supervision, I also had the office in Hong Kong, in, in uh, Turkey, and uh, that's how until I, uh, probably not exactly till I retired, because the company was sold and Klein. And as everybody knows, the uh, company started going down, it's not the same. So I went for a very short time. I was asked to be a consultant at uh, another big company uh, in the garment industry. I was there for a short time, and I retired, and I came to the, uh, because prior to my retirement I used to rent a place in Florida for the winter and then go back and forth but I retired and I moved into uh, Balin Island and I only uh, won the biggest regret you know I have is when I get up in the morning and I look in the window and what a beautiful place I live and the people and only one wish and that makes me very sad <sighs> I wish my parents were here to see it 
But then again, life must go on. And when I look back on my life, my biggest accomplishment, my children, four generations, my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. And, uh, and I would say this is what I'm doing right now.